Of all the sequels, prequels, and spin-offs I've played over the last 18 years, Resident Evil 2 has yet to be outshone. Unleashed in January of 1998 on PlayStation, Resident Evil 2 was a resounding success both critically and financially, shattering sales records as well as our nerves as we once again entered the world of survival horror. This time, the fear was epic. So epic, in fact, this fucker fills two discs. Damn. Really, it's like we've gone from alien to aliens. While the first Resident Evil was a cold sweat inducing horror romp, Resident Evil 2 is a heart stopping thriller, bursting with zombies, riddles, action, and melodrama. Ada! Believe it or not, a Saturn port was once in development, though its cancellation was announced in October of 98 by series creator Shinji Mikami, stating, We were developing Biohazard 2 for Saturn, but found out that it's difficult to achieve the same level of quality on the Saturn that the PlayStation version had. So, in layman's terms, Capcom knew Saturn had all but one foot in the grave and decided to bury the port along with it. Really, if quality were an issue, I sincerely doubt this piece of shit would have ever seen the light of day. Thankfully, it shuffled its merry way to Sega Dreamcast. It picks up two months after the original when rookie cop Leon S. Kennedy rolls into town only to find Raccoon City completely overrun by The Walking Dead. Meanwhile, Claire Redfield has arrived in search of her brother Chris, yeah, that guy from the first game. Once their paths cross, they commandeer a squad car and make haste toward the police station, then bickety-bam, zombies and explosions. These cutscenes are fucking amazing. It's been 18 years since this game's release, and they're just as thrilling now as they were then. If only it were a feature-length movie. Now, if you've played Resident Evil, you know what to expect here. Maze-like environments, ridiculous puzzles, and a healthy dose of zombie carnage. Not to mention undead dobies, giant arachnids, bloodthirsty crows, mutant plants, and these. Oh, ew. They look like flayed penises with legs. So you play as both Leon and Claire. Many puzzles are shared, though some are meant specifically for that character, much like their weaponry. Leon has a 12 gauge and one of the finest hand cannons ever crafted. Claire wields a bow gun and the grenade launcher. They have their own support characters too. Ada Wong teams up with Leon midway through and Claire looks after a little Sherry Burke and though neither one is particularly helpful, you control them for a fleeting moment, breaking up the action while advancing the plot and that's it. Nothing compares to you, Barry. Yeah, yeah. The difficulty's gender neutral this time around, selected whenever you start a new game. Leon's no stronger than Claire, and Claire's no weaker than Leon. Even better is that they have up to eight item slots starting. Way to be progressive, Capcom. Obviously, much of the game takes place in a police station. Like the Spencer Estate, this is where you'll spend most of your time, and that's not a bad thing. It's gigantic, rich with details that make it feel as if people lived and died here. The cluttered desks, shattered glass, and blood-soaked floors tell their own story, and it's a good one. Character animations are a real highlight. Whenever you've taken significant damage, your character of choice clutches their abdomen and shuffles. That's a nice touch. In the original, you'd have to pause the game to know whether or not they needed more weed. Not that it matters with Dreamcast since health and ammo is conveniently displayed through your VMU. I'm sure it's a handy feature for rookies, but veterans should know to reload often, rendering this innovation pointless. The audio is phenomenal, from the unsettling music cues to that jaw-tightening sound of nails clicking against concrete. Resident Evil 2 has the best soundtrack of them all. I especially love the music. The first time you enter that police station, you know you're in for some deep fear. As for the control, this is classic Resident Evil, though the status menu has migrated to the B button, making it more accessible. If you don't care for those tank controls, I suggest you steer clear for nothing has changed. I, on the other hand, happen to like my bipedal panzer, so I'm happier than an unemployed plumber in San Diego. 
My one belly ache here is the analog stick. It works well enough, I guess, though I couldn't get a feel for it. I had the same problem with the DualShock reissue on PlayStation as well as the Nintendo 64 port. Do yourself a favor and stick with the D-pad. You can thank me later. The story has been broken up into two scenarios going on concurrently, beating scenario A with either protagonist will unlock scenario B, where you can play as the opposite character, where you'll gain access to environments and puzzles unique to that scenario, while warding off an old friend. Mr. X, otherwise known as Tyrant. Yeah, he's gotten a makeover since our last encounter. This overgrown flasher shows up early on and proceeds to make your night a living hell, showing up periodically throughout the game with little to no warning. You'll knock him down several times, but he just keeps coming. Though be sure to check his body whenever you wear him out. He has presence. Anyway, the zapping system has its pros and cons. One major pro is that you have to play as both characters if you want the whole story, unlike the original where you can play as either character, though the narrative remains the same. Also, decisions you make during your first playthrough will affect the second, like this locker. When you first encounter it, there's a submachine gun and an item pack. If you take the item pack in Scenario A, the machine gun will be there in Scenario B. Now, that brings me to my first complaint. Besides the locker and a few security gates, these are the only instances in which our decisions matter. I think it's safe to say that this feature is woefully underutilized. Another issue I have is that many puzzles in the second scenario are recycled from the first. Ultimately, these are gripes. I can look past the repetitive nature of certain puzzles, and the zapping system still a neat idea, though I wish these concepts had been fleshed out and perfected. Still, they get an A for effort. As if I haven't given you plenty of reasons to play this game over and over again, there's a boatload of extra features. Besides bonus costumes for both characters and a six-shooter for Claire, there's a few mini-games that will keep you busy long after the credits roll. The fourth survivor has you playing as Hunk, an umbrella operative taking a G-Virus sample back to the extraction point. It plays a lot like the battle game on Saturn, but there's a story to it this time. Like, this was going down while Leon and Claire were trying to escape. That's pretty cool. Then we have Extreme Battle, where you can play with Leon, Claire, Ada, and holy fucking shit, Chris Redfield. Now that is fucking sweet. Unlocking everything is way more challenging now, thanks in large part to the ranking system. Your rank is dependent on your completion time, how often you save, if at all, and first aid sprays used. Trust me, the rewards are well worth the effort. So, how does Dreamcast fare when compared to the PlayStation? Honestly, there's no comparison. Not to say the PlayStation original looks terrible, on the contrary, it's one of the best games available for the console, boasting gorgeous visuals and brilliant CD quality audio. Regardless, Sega's Dreamcast sports a high resolution output and superior audio capabilities. Textures are even sharper, though the backgrounds look soft by comparison. Not bad, mind you, but worth noting. Of all the ports I've played, this is the best by far. Resident Evil 2 set the bar so goddamn high it was hard to imagine any sequel capable of surpassing it. As time would later prove, I wasn't the only one lacking vision. Next time.